today, reality hits the budget. Well, sort of. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. The Mid-Year Economic and Fiscal Outlook, or MAIFO, has been released. And as expected, the government is still forecasting a surplus this year, though down from $7.1 billion to $5 billion. But that is still the first surplus in 12 years. The surplus for 2021 is now $6.1 billion instead of $11 billion, as previously estimated. And tax receipts are down $32.6 billion over four years. Wage growth forecasts were reduced, but are still too optimistic in my view at 2.5% for the next two years, not least because of the structural changes that we've been seeing in employment, including part-time and gig economy jobs. And the unemployment rate was expected to be higher than hoped at 5.25%, rather than 5% for this financial year and next. The Treasury still is sticking with a 5% employment threshold, below which inflation is expected to rise, while the RBA has this at 4.5%. Now that, of course, is academic, with the current rate at 5.3% and likely to rise higher ahead. The forecast for economic growth has reduced from 2.75% to 2.25% and the downgrade to growth was blamed on weak momentum in the global economy as well as domestic challenges such as the effects of the drought and bushfires. The drought in Australia had already taken a quarter percentage point of GDP and reduced farm output by a significant amount over the last two years. And growth is then expected to strengthen to two and three quarters percent in 2021 and they shrunk the expected surpluses over the next four years due to a downgrade of tax receipts, with total receipts revised down by $3 billion in 2019-20 and by $32.6 billion over the four years to 22-23, and GST to the states is nearly down $2 billion in the next year due to weaker activity. Australia's interest bill on its debt will fall, they say, from $19 billion last year to $14.5 billion, thanks to low interest rates. And over the next four years, the lower rates will amount to a saving of $13.5 billion. Meanwhile, the mid-year update included a $623.9 million aged care package, but there were no other major spending measures to lift economic growth. And this will keep the pressure on the Reserve Bank of Australia to reduce the cash rate even further next year. So in essence, the Treasury is leaving the action to the Reserve Bank and further confirmation we're likely to get more cuts to rates next year. But they're also counting on stronger house prices, leading to a positive wealth effect. This is what they said. After a recent period of significant falls in housing prices from mid to late 2017 to mid-2019, the established housing market has stabilised. In July 2019, combined capital city housing prices rose for the first time in almost two years, and this has continued in recent months. Although increases have been largely in Sydney and Melbourne, increases have now spread to all cities except Darwin. Overall, combined capital city housing prices are now almost 6% higher than their recent trough in June, though they are still around 5% lower than their peak in September 2017. This increase in housing prices is expected to support the outlook for household consumption, particularly as corresponding increases in housing turnover should see a pickup in spending on household goods such as furnishings. And more broadly, continued rise in housing prices should provide a boost to confidence and household wealth, as well as increasing borrowing capacity given changes in collateral. Ownership transfer costs, the various fees incurred when fixed assets such as dwellings are sold, including legal and real estate agents fees, stamp duty and other government charges, were negatively affected by low rates of housing market turnover in 2018-19 and detracted from real GDP growth. Ownership transfer costs rose by 4.5% in the September quarter 2019 and a further increase supported by stronger housing turnover and prices should, they say, contribute to economic growth over the forecast period. And they said that movings in housing prices impact dwelling investment activity through 
changes to expected returns to residential construction. However, recent price gains will affect new dwelling investment with a delay. This is because planning and approval processes take time to work their way through into new construction. On average, depending on the type of dwelling, it can take somewhere between two and five months for new dwellings to commence following approval and a further six to 20 months for activity to be completed. High density dwellings have the longest approval and construction times and the houses the shortest on average. New dwelling approvals have trended down since late 2017, with the total number of building approvals over the year to October 2019 down by more than 20% from the preceding 12 months and below the 10-year average. The falls in building approvals have been particularly stark in medium to high density dwellings, which also have the longest lag between approval and completion. This means that further moderation in dwelling investments is likely over the forecast period. This weakness should be partially offset by a solid pipeline of housing construction work yet to be done. And the other area of sensitivity is the iron ore price and commodity prices in general. Again, they discuss this in some detail. They say iron ore spot prices increased sharply in the first half of 2019, mainly due to supply issues in Australia and Brazil and stronger than expected demand from China. Iron ore prices peaked in late July at almost $120 US per tonne. Prices have since fallen but remain above the price assumed in the 2019 pre-election economic and fiscal outlook, or PEFO as it's called. The decline in the price has been mainly due to uncertainty about demand from Chinese steel mills and the recovery in supply. As such, prudent assumptions have been retained and the iron ore spot price is assumed to decline to reach $55 US per tonne by the end of June 2020. This is one quarter later than was assumed in the PEFO. Coal prices have fallen since PEFO. Metallurgical coal prices have fallen faster and further than had been assumed at PEFO, with the spot price below 150 US dollars per tonne since October 2019. The fall in the spot price is due in large to uncertainty about demand from Chinese steel mills and policy changes in China. The metallurgical coal price is assumed to remain at around recent levels of $134 US per tonne over the forecast period. This is lower than the PFO assumption, which was for the price to fall to $150 US per tonne by the end of March 2020. After reaching a peak of just over $125 US dollars per tonne in mid-2018, thermal coal prices have trended lower, mainly due to increases in seaborne supply and softer global demand. The thermal coal price is assumed to remain around recent levels of $64 US dollars a tonne over the forecast period, below the PFO assumption of $91 US dollars a tonne. If the iron ore price were to fall immediately to $55 US dollars per tonne, two quarters earlier than assumed, nominal GDP could be around $7.5 billion lower than forecast in 2019-20 and $0.3 billion lower in 20. 21, and this would have a negative flow on impact to company tax receipts estimated at around $0.8 billion in 2019-20 and $1.1 billion in 2021. By contrast, they say if the iron ore price remained elevated for two quarters longer than currently assumed before falling immediately to $55 US per tonne, nominal GDP could be around $6.4 billion higher than the forecast in 2019-20 and $1 billion higher in 2021, and this would have a flow on impact to company tax receipts estimated as around $0.5 billion in 2020 and $1.3 billion in 2021. So to conclude, the variability in the economic outlook continues to be household spending and the link to home price growth and commodity exports, which remain in positive territory for now, thanks to high prices of iron ore. But there are two issues we should consider. First is that migration is likely to remain hot, stoking the total GDP outturn and increasing demand for homes. But this continues to put downward pressure on wages, which will continue lower for longer. 
And second, the Treasury has effectively blown a raspberry at the RBA with little additional investment over the already announced infrastructure spend. Thus, the RBA will have to take rates even lower. But as we are already approaching zero bounds, this means that unconventional policies will be on the cards next year. And that will be good for wealthy investors, but for the rest of us, it's a poor outlook. Given that, households are unlikely to see income growth rising for some long time, and that is not a good result for the majority of quiet Australians. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time. 